Our guest today was John Karsabayev, co-founder and managing partner at Big Sky Capital. John, what did, what did we discuss today? Exposing the world of VCs from the other side of the spectrum of how VCs actually make money. We spoke a lot about how to take million bucks and make that into 100 million by investing into real estate and how to choose the right assets and what to stay away from. We went into you know the rabbit holes as far as the fees charged and how to fundraise, where to find investors. So that was one side of the conversation. How to find the right people, how to interview them, how to find spot unique talents and to be able to build a team of top performers that will stay with you forever. So if you're looking to build your own fund, go fundraise and do all of that. You want to tune in to all of the things that we've covered. Yeah, you covered it all. I mean, John shared a lot of personal stories along the way from 24 years in the US. This was a fascinating episode. If you if you want to learn about venture capital, real estate investing, how to hire great talent, what's the importance of sports in your life, you would really enjoy this episode. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yet another episode of Factorial Podcast. Today is our guest, John Karsabayev, co-founder and managing partner at Big Sky Capital. John, welcome to the program. Thank you, Arman. It's a pleasure. Big fan of the show. Excited that uh, finally we were able to make that happen. Thank you so much. And uh, Danik asked us to explain why this show is going to be in English. I think ultimately the reason is uh, we want to experiment with a new format. John recently gave an interview in Russian. I mean, but at, at the same time, he's been living in the U.S. for the past 24 years, so it's probably more natural to to do um, to do an English episode. Um, and uh, there you are. I mean, it makes sense. Plus, a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about is very highly technical things, and a lot mm -hmm. of that is very. I think it's not easy to translate that, especially yeah, terminology and all of that. So that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So we would would love to start with a with a bang. I mean, where the Venture capital. We discussed this topic quite a quite a few times on the show. And um, venture capitalists, they have sort of st stereotypes about them: um, uh, wearing uh, pa Patagonia vests and uh, Montclair uh, <laughs> cups, and um, saying things like Rick Rubin recently. What do you actually do and stuff like that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the first question, which we haven't discussed, I believe, in the previous episodes: How do venture capitalists make money? million dollar question uh and short answer is we don't really make money if you look looking to get into venture capital with the goal to make money it's probably a wrong career for you to for you to choose because at the end of the day especially the very early years let's say from fund one through fund maybe three which is anywhere from two to seven years you you're not going to make any money because, and I'll explain why the semantics of the structure of the fees and all of that stuff. Um, so short answer is there is no money. The money is in the exits. The money is in when they actually, you know, IPO happens or some type of liquidity event, which we all know that duration is actually getting longer and longer because startup founders and all that, they're not so inclined to get out of their projects because they put blood, sweat and tears into building that. Why do I need to exit? I just want to keep building building stuff that I'm um, I'm a fan of. But essentially, for VCs, is just like any other startup as well. We go through a, a very traditional fundraising route. It's just different conversations we have, and we explain for fund one LPs, the limited partners. Essentially, those are our investors. They invest into us, uh, us meaning our uh, the partners, the co-founders of the fund who we're all about, what are we all about, and what makes us unique, what's the unfair advantage, because there isn't a lot of track record. Yes, there's maybe some track record on the, on the angel investing side, but that doesn't really count because on the venture capital side, it's a completely different ballgame. So it's same process. You meet with the LPs. It's an ongoing fundraising tour. It never ends, actually. We, we fundraise 24-7 through 65. It, it's, an, it's an ongoing cycle. Um, but some of the some of the areas where we are able to generate actually revenue for the company as as a fund as a venture capital firm I, I should I should say not a fund uh, first one is the management fee that's that's charged against the total committed capital typically anywhere from I've seen 1.5 to 3.5 any any anything over 3.5 to 5 percent that's that's uh, you know it's it's an anomaly. Uh, but anywhere between 1.5 and 3 is usually the standard. 
So we that management fee covers a lot of the the, the salaries for our analysts, associates, the principals. Uh, you know, travel. Cause we can talk about travel. Travel is crazy extensive for for VC space, and I'll explain the reasons why. And the the other side of the spectrum is the carry. Carry means carried interest. So carried interest, we charge twenty percent, uh, and there's a range anywhere from I've seen ten to thirty percent. What that means is basically, in basic terminology, is when the company gets sold or when the company exits and there's profits, all of the first money is being returned to the investors, our LPs, and then anything that's over that, the profit over what they had invested, we take 20% off of that. So as you can see, there's a lot of hands in the pot. There's a lot of things to give back, I guess. And then if there's anything left, we'll take a small percentage of that. So that's in a nutshell how VCs actually try to make money. Well, on that note, you mentioned that it's very sort of it's not the best career if your goal is to maximize uh, the, the, the amount of money you're making. Um, I would say like 2018, um, a friend of mine and uh, in India, we, we were talking about exactly this uh, topic and uh, he did the following analysis. He looked at... Uh, um, uh, four, top 400 people uh, in Forbes list, mm -hmm. like by wealth, it's all billionaires, and just counted the number of the, the number of them who are venture capitalists, and he f he counted only two, <laughs> and when it comes to the finance sector, but there were 70 who made billions in uh, private equity and, mm -hmm. and hedge funds. Yeah. So uh, that, that's actually very very much telling, kind of the the, the kind of business that is is a, it's a really tough business to be in. And you need to love the game to 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 you need to love innovation, startups, or those kind of things, right? Yeah, that, that's a very good point. And you probably on that Forbes list, you'll see majority is probably real estate. Maybe that dominates. But when we talk about venture capital, you're right. Venture capital is actually is part of the private equity category, but it's actually one of the riskiest categories. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at the overall pie chart portfolios of the you know the endowments and other you know financial investment um, vehicles. Typically, VC space represents anywhere maybe five, maybe top up to ten percent of the overall por portfolio. Very small percentage, because like you mentioned, it's there's a lot of risks. There's not a lot of um, you know. Well, there is opportunity to liquidate, but it's not as simple as let's say I don't know stocks or real estate. So those things uh, they play into some of the decision making process why you would want to get into that as a career mm -hmm. and in your mind do you have some types of people who become great ven uh, venture capitalists do you have certain categories of people who you would say okay you that, that's that that will be a good ca career for you for sure and we we thought a lot about this me and Adil, when we were talking about actually formulating building this as as our own because we could have been a lot easier for us just to go and join an existing VC fund and firm and just become a partner there and no problems at all. You just, you just, you know, talk to amazing founders and try to help them. But when building your own, um, at the end of the day, the really good, exceptional VCs, at least the ones that I look up to, one common denominator is they had multiple, multiple companies of their own, lots of successful failures of their own. And they, throughout the process, actually, we've encountered that many, many times when we were fundraising for our startups. We thought that, especially maybe during a pitch or during the encounter with another VC or another investor, it was like, that's the, that's the shit that I wouldn't do. If I was ever an investor, I would do completely opposite. And a lot of those things, I mean, that list was growing. And we, we just thought that, you know, it's something that, there's a lot of room for opportunity to fix. There's a lot of room for uh, for growth in that space. Because unfortunately, there's also a lot of VCs that have never built their own companies. Mm -hmm. And that's that's just like me taking a, a fitness advice from a fat person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of in a nutshell where, where I'm taking this from. So, so from you believe uh, former entrepreneurs get to become the best VCs. You have to, you have mm -hmm. to be, I, I hear also a lot from maybe some, some of my Harvard grads, the, from a financial consulting sector who are very heavy on that, mm -hmm. that, oh, I'm just going to study that I'm going to private equity and then I'm going to 
perhaps choose the track of venture capital and apply all of the theory that I had learned from the formulas, from all of the economics standpoint, how to calculate and project from financial standpoint, whether that has a great upside or not, whether the market is great, all of that. I think that's a completely wrong approach. Uh, and number one, it's all about the former entrepreneurs, especially those that, you know, have have many, many successful failures at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Exits are great. Exits are great. They give you a lot of, you know, credibility. But at the same time, if you've gone through that entire process, never gave up. I think that you, you, you have a lot of battle scars that you can actually share with the founders that you look into back. Yeah, I, mean, I guess the reason why the sort of models, uh, prediction, predictive models don't really rarely work with venture capital is because the best returns happen to be when it's a category defining company which created a market, mm -hmm. uh, entered a market which actually was non-existent at the moment. So it actually doesn't make sense to fund this company if you just right. were to apply classic sort of uh, financial modeling. But that's where all your returns are. I was just recently looking up at the net worth of, uh, what's his name? Um, can we can do a blanking on his name? It is a professor at Stanford who uh, backed Google. Is is his net worth is ten billion? Uh, he he put in hundred k, I think, yeah. back in ninety eight. And uh, yeah, you, you you can't just you can't uh, model that. <laughs> what what will happen to this hundred k? Right? There is no formula for that. There is <laughs> no checklist. So we yeah. there is no class in school that says that if you follow those five steps, that's where you're gonna get it. And you 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 made a really good point that a lot of times you have to go against the grain. And just be like, okay, I'm just gonna take take a risk. And VC is all about risk management. And if you see an opportunity, but perhaps nine out of ten, not gonna work out. But if you're lucky and if you really believed in that particular person, maybe that one time is what's gonna make the the most difference. Yeah, David Sheridan just just it just came to me. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to the mechanics, let's say we have a potential venture capitalists who don't want to join a firm. Uh, they want to start their own uh, venture capital firm. What are the mechanics of starting a fund? You know, you have Angelus, like who takes care of all the admin for 25K, maybe there's some other options. If you could sort of uh, show the landscape of what, what the options are. Yeah, great question, because we, we also underestimated that, the complexity of building your own venture capital firm and then the fund. Uh, of how much of a structure that is, how much of actually full-time job that is to build that out. Because it's you've mentioned a few tools like Carta, AngelList, which are great. <clears throat> I think that those are exceptional for very early stage, maybe for fund one. But we're already realizing that it's probably not going to work out for us as we're fundraising for fund two. And But that, that's a great start because they have a lot of majority of the ca use cases for venture capital fund management covered with it out of the box uh, solution. There's a lot of customization needed, especially if you're dealing a lot with international LPs, just like us, we have a lot of LPs from Kazakhstan, we have a lot of LPs from Southeast Asia. So there, that plays into that. And that complicates the process because you think, oh, they just commit, write you a check, done deal. No, you gotta go through the whole entire onboarding process. You gotta go through the KYC process. Then you also gotta go through the whole commitment versus the actual cash calls so every every let's say you you you, you I, I pitch to you and you say okay guys i'm in for one million dollars into your fund mm -hmm. that one million dollars is is not going to be called up front mm -hmm. that that's that's a misconception that uh typically is broken out into three cash calls through the life cycle of the fund Life cycle of the fund ranges anywhere from, let's say, two to four years. That's our investment period. That's mm -hmm. when we deploy all of the capital. Mm -hmm. um, so throughout that process, you do probably three cash calls. One is at the beginning, one is at the, you know, the midterm, and then one towards, towards the end of the cycle. Um, the angel list, the beauty of that is because it's also very cost effective. You mentioned 25K, which is pretty accurate. Uh, they have solutions ranging, ranging from 15 to 30K. Uh, but that's very, very cost effective. We actually looked at hiring our own legal team and the lawyers that specialize in that. And that typically starts starts at 50K. Um, that could they go all the way to 100. But they also come with maybe a package of all of the legal agreements and all of the documents that you would need to share with your LPs that they would sign the subscription forms, the LPAs, the, lim the limited partner agreements. Those are some of the most standard ones, but those are like 100 pages long each. 
and uh, the so the the process is then becomes you you get all of the lps onboarded you do all the cash calls and then the 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 back office we we use angel list ourselves um then you go through the process of the, the kind of withdrawing or taking out the management fee which needs to be completely separate to be able to cover all of the fees all of the expenses and everything else um, but that whole reporting structure the financial mechanism of the platform such as angelist is convenient because then we have to report on all of the financial progress of all the portfolio companies um, tax reporting the jurisdiction reporting from the just you know just the fees that we charge so that, that that's a full-time job of its own so i'm i'm painting a very high level picture but i, I also want to relay that how you know if you were to get into that space it's important to do the homework before you actually do that because that could that could make it or break it um if you're not fully set up to from a timeline st standpoint alone that could take about anywhere from anywhere from six to six to 12 months very extensive process so you, your recommendation for fund one for a sort of a no, uh, for a new venture capital firm is to let's say do it with uh, angelus but have a have a full-time employee who also uh, manages it on, on your behalf or yeah well probably you don't need an on-staff full-time employee one of those services they will provide you with with a dedicated kind of that success manager account manager uh, but it's they are yours and i can see how much of engagement that is uh how how many moving parts just working with portfolio companies when we say we're going to invest that doesn't end there they need to then get also get onboarded onto AngelList, and we need to do the you know the the cash withdrawal and how do we wire the money out to them so there's a lot of complexities there but if you are looking to get into that make sure you you do a lot of research on that mm -hmm. because it's there's there's a lot of moving parts why are you thinking of moving away from angelus to with, with fund two mm -hmm. and have a lawyer on your staff yeah and we we would we would most likely need to build out our own uh, platform as well. And a lot of my colleagues in VC space, they've encountered that same solution that they actually built out their own portal. They've built out their own financial reporting mechanism because every fund is different. Every fund has its own unique investment thesis. Every fund has its own, you know, geographic uh, focus or maybe industry focus. And all of those metrics, all of those things are completely different on what you report on and what you track on. So hence the need to really either go to AngelList or Card and say, you know, I'll pay you guys millions of dollars. Can you guys customize it all for me? Which doesn't make sense. And that, that product doesn't even belong to you versus going out there and building something of our own in-house uh, that really fits our portfolio companies fits our lps and fits us as the fund because the fund too is you know probably investment thesis is also going to evolve hmm. so those are some of the things that we already starting to think forward um, because we don't want to be kind of limited by the limitations of something that's out of the box mm -hmm. one of the approaches when you're starting a, f a fund especially you uh, when, when you're starting a firm and raising for fund one is to build an advisory board and let's say your advisory board they are not your lps uh, they are let's say big names in the business but they are not going to commit any capital in uh, in your firm uh, first two questions on that question one is it a good idea question two is what are the mechanics of onboarding them like do you sign an agreement with those advisors and you do you uh, do you give them, let's say, one percent of carry for all the deals they, they bring? What is what some what are some of the, what is some uh, what is a kind of good incentive structure for them to to join you? I, I personally think it's a good idea. We have the advisory board as well. They helped us big time with fundraising for for the first fund because mm -hmm. uh, for various reasons they give you credibility, they give you network, they give you access. They also make I mean they make a lot of introductions on on your behalf. Um, there's different ways to structure those relationships. Yes, you can definitely share the carry, uh, but it becomes a little bit problematic to to calculate and and, and figure that out afterwards. Hey, I, uh, I like hey, this is a co I would like to connect you with this company. Hey, I, I already connected with them like two months ago. <laughs> so, hey, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and then when when the liquidity event happens, then how do you even calculate that? That I give you zero point six five percent of a of a of a of a one percent of a carry. 
from from what so i i would recommend staying away from that because mm -hmm. it just becomes too complicated to track that mm -hmm. for fund one i would just keep it very simple uh the advisors you want to attract are the ones that have the network even though maybe they're not ready to invest in your fund just yet mm -hmm. but they also observing you they also watching you how you go into operate how you if i make an introduction to you uh, how are you going to run with that? And are you going to bring that to, to, to fruition or are you just going to give up after a first uh, introductory call? So there's a lot of that observation as well. The other thing that advisors also bring that you want to, to pay attention to is maybe a unique deal flow or access to very, very interesting and unique startups. For example, we have a gentleman, his name is John Younger. He's a senior editor at Forbes, the US Forbes um previous relationships you know we've we've been friends for a very long time but the reason we really went after him to be one of our advisors and also a venture partner uh is because of his access to very very custom and uh unique deal flow meaning a lot of startups come to him and say oh please write about me please write about me oh my god so he he has a lot of that a lot of that that fluff but also he has a lot of the companies that already either finalizing their rounds or they coming to him and saying, look, we're about to close this round and here's the VCs that we've attracted. Is that something of interest for you to cover? So he, he works with a lot of companies like that. And then in return, he makes an introduction also for us saying, hey, they almost done with that round, for example. Are you interested in joining them as well? So it's a win-win all across, three ways. Founder wins, he wins, us as VCs, we, we win the deal, we get access. So those are just examples of the types of advisors and why you would want to build that out. What do you, what do you what's the ideal incentive structure for them in your mind? So with, the, with, about, with about five or six advisors that we have, for them, it's also an exposure into that, you know, into that world. Uh, a lot of them are C-level executives at Fortune 500 organizations. They are not necessarily very familiar with just overall industry of VC, how that works, why that works, what do you even do there? And I'll, I'll share some stories through the fundraising process, what, how, what we encountered. But for them, they're at the top of the food chain, the top of the career ladder. Some of the things they look to get into is, for example, joining the boards of the companies. So being a, being part of the VC network or being an advisor to a VC, you automatically expose yourself to a lot of those opportunities to be an advisor to startups, be a board member to those startups. So a lot of the, the, the advisors that we've attracted kind of has been from that angle because obviously we can't compensate you, we can't pay you, we, we, and we try not to get into the whole carry splits. Mm -hmm. um, but it's more of a, I can provide you with those opportunities because I know where you at in a career. And for you just to go out there and post on LinkedIn that I'm open to board, board seats, good luck with that. There's not going to be, you know, a line out, out, outside your door. So those are just some of the things that really help them get motivated and interested in joining the, the fund such as ours. Mm -hmm. Let's say you, you, you built that advisory board. Now you're ready to fundraise. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things you need to put in your deck before you start the fundraising? <laughs> great question we we've we've tweaked that gazillion of times I, I think we still tweak that even when with the with the second round tour that we're about to go on uh it started out with just painting the picture of ourselves first who we are you know at the end of the day here's my money go ahead can you multiply that what kind of person you are who you are uh, a lot of that is relationship driven the also we realized the importance of a story that you tell as a first time vintage fund what really really makes you so different from like hundreds and thousands of funds out there because everyone claims they have a unique proprietary deal flow i have a very unfair advantage from you know the technology stack that i have or maybe the company that i worked at now i'm an alumni and all these guys are coming to me various angles various ways to do that but the story that you tell and i think the angle of the longevity meaning that i'm not in it for a quick buck um in it to build a generational organization the also the story that we've told that we want our kids to be involved in something like this hopefully they they get interested 
but it's also kind of that that legacy driven view into kind of maybe you as an LP you want to be part of this because you would want your kids to be involved with something like this when they become of age and they get interested in something like this so during those early days those are the things that we really paid attention to and it, it actually does work it resonates on so many levels with you know the hundreds and thousands of lp pitch meetings that we've had so those are just initial versions of uh, of the the actual pitch deck and when you when you actually start the fundraising process what's the what's the approach let's say you you build your excel sheet you put all the family offices you happen to know um what's the order you 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 go after them <laughs> yeah good luck with family offices because <laughs> they they they're not gonna look at you it's it's too early and that's uh they but it's good to start talking to them because you need to keep them in a loop you need to keep them close potentially for fund five whatever fund three um but that's exactly that we went through the exercise of our own network and we said which ones are as we call it closest to the money that have the have the right capacity meaning from resources standpoint but also understand this space what is vc all about why 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 essentially why they would want to join something like this why not just go put your money into whatever real estate or start investing on your own or just go into public markets something like that so we went through that exercise identified those kind of the lowest hanging fruits from a connection standpoint uh, and then we just very, very warm preliminary conversations didn't show up with a pitch deck you know probably till like third or fourth meeting uh -huh. um it all starts out with just a very casual conversation let me catch up with you let's go to dinner let's go let's talk a lot of dinners a lot of lunches you're gonna get fat if you if you if you don't work out because you have to do a lot of that whining and dining meaning it's a very casual conversation you tell your story it, yeah exactly it's not intrusive you're not selling you're not pitching you're just basically coming and saying look here's my vision i'm very passionate about this what are your thoughts what am i missing and you just kind of have that dialogue and then it's shapes into a conversation okay this is going in the direction that maybe i want to be part of and then you actually start whipping out the pitch decks the data rooms all of that stuff and then go through the semantics of but by that time it's very clear if they want to join or not what's the um, ideal uh, period from the lunch one and lunch four when you actually close no oh, i hope it's a couple of days but <laughs> it's uh, it takes months it takes months. months and months and months sometimes up to it's a year-long process to to cultivate that one connection that one relationship a lot of times it may not lead to anything it may not lead to nothing because there is just not the right time for them um but it's a very lengthy process it's starting from the very first conversation especially with those who are not very familiar with the vc space because it's a very educational process and we encounter that by 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 you know we didn't even know because i thought cto of a fortune 500 organization knows this space turns out he doesn't for valid reasons he was never an interest for him he, he was just building a career he was just in charge of his organization he wasn't looking out you know just i'm gonna go invest into startups so that made a lot of sense and but we encountered that through like oh shit, they don't even know what lp means let's completely take it back you know three levels above and and start you know just a very from very rudimentary basics of what that's all about let's say we were to build a, a micro vc fund with 10 m 10 million under management um what does what's the minimum check size do you recommend do you recommend having no more than 100 lps um and based on that let's say if 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 the minimum check is 100 i think according to the some sec regulations you cannot have more than 99 lps yes, or something like that exactly something along those lines so let's say if you want to have 99 lps you do you build a list of thousand people who you thousands prospect thousand prospects to to actually get to us 99 it, it could be thousand it could be ten thousand because there's ways to structure that but you're absolutely right De depending on the jurisdiction of where you're going to register a fund but they're very similar rules depending on the thresholds of the fund size there is limits on how many lps you can actually have uh the the bigger the fund i think the smaller the lps but also at the end of the day you have to keep in mind that you then have to manage those lps so the more lps you have 
more work you have on managing all the egos, all of the personalities, all of the people and all of the questions, all of that. So, of course, the less is more, less is better. But when it comes to fundraising, it's it's never easy. So it's a lot of times you have to make certain exceptions where you understand you are really good at, let's say, the podcasting and your education school and all of that great stuff. And I'm looking to invest into startups in that space. But you're telling me, look, I can't meet your minimum check size, for example, whatever, 250,000. Why don't I come in with something much less, let's say 100K, but here's the expertise that I bring. So we have to play that balancing act. We have to always evaluate, can that person bring much more to the table, more than just money? And do they really also understand the this space? You have to be very, very honest with them because it's not overnight. It's a very, very long game. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, people are gonna start asking, well, where's my money? Yeah. <laughs> when am I gonna get it back? Let's say you have a LP who committed a million and then uh, you called the first 300K initially. And then on the second call, they are, do they have any obligations to commit to the second call? What are you protected by law? <laughs> that I mean, from contractual perspective, yes, uh, because you sign an LPA, you sign all of the subscription documents where it states that you're committing to that amount. What are we going to do if they say no? I mean, we, what are we going to sue them and go after? Probably not. We, mm -hmm. I mean, relationship matters more probably than that. Um, so they do have, and it happens. It, mm -hmm. it, it happens. It happens. You know, things change, mm -hmm. especially if you're not, you know, you're doing cash calls throughout the period of like two to four years, let's say. A lot can change. So at the end of the day, it's also being very proactive from that standpoint, saying, hey, you, you know, maybe in six months and eight months, we're going to be doing the cash call. Where are you at? What's the situation that you think we're going to encounter certain situations? So those things really can be pre prevented. If you're being very proactive from your communication standpoint and not just showing up at the door, you know, at the 11th hour saying, oh, hey, by the way, can you wire transfer me tomorrow? <laughs> like, what the fuck, man? Like, I, uh, you know, some kind of heads up would have been nice. So those are some of the things that play into that relationship building with LPs as you go through that entire life cycle. But to your question, it happens quite a bit. And uh, it, it just, it's a, it's a case by case. Part it's of the game. Uh, part of the game. And I think at the end of the day, if, relationship is very important then that's that's that would be the focus of your resolution let's say you succeeded with your fundraising process the fund is raised you're successfully investing in startups what are the ideal relationships like with your lps do you send them quarterly updates uh do you do you have to take their calls every time they call you and asking where my money is what's what's the ideal uh, what's the ideal relationship vc in vc space so we have two sets of clients at the end of the day the founders and our lps so we serve both um lps obviously yes when they call you answer <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's a very short answer you 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 do answer and you but communicate 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 that you can't you can't overdo that on on any spectrum i'm 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 a big proponent of that i'd rather over communicate than have you running around assuming things and then making your own assumptions and that leads to certain whatever misconceptions so yes lp updates on at least on a quarterly basis which you know gives you a breakdown of here's from the fund standpoint where we at Here's a section on all of the portfolio companies and their performance. And then also we like to include some of the things that we observe in the markets as trends, as, as insights. What are we seeing? What are we observing? What are we staying away from? What are we, you know, maybe potentially going to be investing in? Because as an LP, I would be interested in that. What, what, how proactive you are in terms of trying to stay ahead of the curve from the market standpoint. Um, so that communication is always there. And then, it, it, you know, participating on, you know, podcasts like this as well for us as GPs of the fund is very important as well because it allows us constantly communicate to masses and also our, you know, that information gets to our LPs as well on what are we doing, what are we busy with, what are some of the things that we, we cover, what are things that we're staying away from. So it's just an ongoing cycle of constant communication. Mm -hmm. well, and let's say you you have access to some of the funds run by your friends. What portion of your uh, AUM do you recommend to place in those funds as an LP? 
if you as a, as a venture capitalist? Zero, 10, five? Meaning me as a fund manager, but also being, ent- a, being an LP in by, other- Being an LP in other funds. For sure, that's that's a strategy as well. That's a, it's a, a, lot, a lot of VCs do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you could also, you know, especially if you're a larger fund, let's say you, you know, 500 mil AUM or, you know, something extensive as such, you can invest as an LP into other funds from your management fee. So you take the portion of your management fee, you invest into other funds as an LP because that, for obvious reasons, it gives you just so much exposure. You basically just hired, you know, 10 associates by being an LP in the other fund. You just hired, you know, 20 VC scouts. You just hired, you know, 15 venture partners. So that makes a lot of sense. And a lot of them actually do that. But can you place non-management fees, but the actual uh, money, which is um, allocated for startups to invest? You mean taking my own well, uh, from the from the from the actual fund? Yes, and take fund. that money to yeah. invest into other funds. No, you can't. You can't. Uh, yeah, it's got to be either yeah. your own money, or it has to be, a or it has fee. to be from the management fee. Why? Because it? it's from legal structure standpoint. There's certain parameters of the investment thesis that we subscribe to, mm. and if it doesn't fit, and at the end of the day, from legal standpoint, it's also very challenging from liquidation perspective. How do we then allocate that money back into the fund when when those funds are returned to us? So it's very complicated, and it's 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 uh, from legal structure standpoint, I wouldn't even recommend going that route. Let's say your fund is stage agnostic, geography agnostic. What's the is there a sort of plain vanilla template, Delaware LP kind of structure? which allows you to be as general as possible mm-hmm. without subscribing to any thesis, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of VCs actually do that, try to try to stay as generalist as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, be, because of those reasons of the setup standpoint, because you can actually buy a boilerplate templated legal agreements, for example, uh, that nothing specific to geography, nothing specific to a you know, particular industry. So that happens quite a bit. Uh, and then your fund evolves. Then, then your firm evolves as you start building track record and maybe you build the muscle in a certain category and you're saying, I'm going to go all in, let's say, on a fund too. So that makes a lot of sense. And actually a lot of VCs start from a generalist standpoint and then build out the branches to go into more specialty. Oh, one more question. Any venture capital firms you look up to and you uh, you learn from? Well, the, the biggest ones, the, the most kind of the tenured, the, the sequoias of the world, I mean, their story is just incredible from just how generational of a approach that has been uh, from the very, very beginning and how they actually mold and build the next generation of partners that will be partners, let's say, in 10, 15 years and how they take that approach from the hiring standpoint, how they interview, how they onboard. And then they, they mold you into that, into that route because it's, it's one of those funds that very rarely, you know, people actually leave because it's just, it's such a tenured long-term view into just building the company together versus just, oh, let me just go out there, build a fund and, you know, just be done with that. So, you know, Sequoia is definitely one of those. Andreessen is, you know, they, they very famous for just being practitioners first. And then applying that methodology into how they would invest is just I learned a lot from them from the what they talk about and essentially here's some of the lessons learned from our fundraising process and a lot he covers a lot in his books the the good thing about the good things he talks a lot about how they've gone through the whole fundraising process and the other the other his most recent book is how to uh, who you are is yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, yeah. something like that Heart, yeah. Um, so he covers some of those battle, battle stories, how they went through the, the fundraising and what they learned and how that would apply to their investment. What do you, what you do is how you, who you are, something like that. Yeah, I can't remember the name, but it's more recent one. It's basically uh, the culture is nothing, not, is, it's not the words, but the actions. You, right, right, you right, take, right, essentially. Exactly, yeah. exactly. The sequel to hard thing about hard things. And, uh, wh- when it comes to maybe venture capitalists, any, any ones you, you follow and you closely read and look up to. Yeah, quite a few of them. And, um, you know, the, obviously the, the big names out there with that we all follow, uh, but a couple of them that I'm, I'm good friends with, uh, for example, Unshackled Ventures, uh, mm-hmm. Nitin, Nitin 
Patricia, his name is, he's one of the founders. Their investment thesis is so unique. They, uh, they, it's, it's based on the premise of backing immigrant founders. Mm -hmm. And they actually do have a platform that allows immigrant founders come to US legally, work and operate, and they provide them with this whole infrastructure to be able to do that. To me, that's a very unfair advantage because you know we have that component to that as well because just being immigrants ourselves, you just resonate so much better with the fellow immigrant who's coming into, let's say, crazy market like US without any access to capital. Because if you're not SMP, meaning stale, male, and pale, who grew up <laughs> in US, you yes. probably don't have the access to the network. You probably don't even know how the whole industry works. So VCs like that, they open up a lot of those doors and you skip a lot of chapters through that process by partnering with you know funds like that. Yeah, one-way ventures, Simeon Dukac has yes. a similar pieces. Just Next gen, a lot of the, you know, the um man, hustle fund. Hustle uh, fund, yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot of these guys, they Former actually- Former 500 people, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Started. Exactly. Interesting. Um, a lot, of, a lot to talk about in venture capital, but uh, um, let's let's turn and move to a second chapter, mm -hmm. which is real estate investing. Mm. Let's say we we have someone in the audience um, who have a million bucks and who wants to invest in real estate in the U.S. Mm. You've been doing it for quite some time. What are some of your tricks and trade uh, and tips of a trade? Million bucks, huh? Well, in certain markets. Like the market I'm in, it's probably you probably not gonna get you much. Okay. But that's a great starting capital. That's actually I wish I was starting out with million bucks, just going and building out the portfolio. But U.S. is so unique in the sense that not even every state is different. Every city is very different, and every jurisdiction is completely different. So you have to just you 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 have to be zero in focus, laser focused on the area that you want to invest in. Because we're here, for example, my market of Miami. Oh, great beaches and all that stuff. Just go buy a condo by the beach, rent it out and just let the money and the appreciating value. No brainer. But every little area, every little town is so unique in a sense because of the schools, because of the taxes, because of all of the previous history and the companies that are there. Um, so I would look at it from a standpoint of what are you really trying to do with that million bucks first? Is that you want to flip? Do you want to, do you want to, you know, make, you know, invest million bucks and then in return get 1.2, 1.3 in a period of six to eight months. That's also possible. And that's, there's a lot of opportunities for, for that to, you know, the fix and flips are very popular. Or do you want to build out more of a portfolio with a longer term view where you just would invest that into a property, you rent it out, you can, you know, you, you renovate, you, you make a lot of improvements. It appreciates in value. You don't sell that property, but you do something that's very popular, like a cash out refinance. And you take the money that you originally invested in, and then you put that into the new property. Because if you come in with a million bucks, you probably don't want to go in and buy something cash like that. You, 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 it's, it doesn't make a lot of financial sense. I would just take that million bucks and use that as a 20% down payment on something that's, you know, much, much bigger than that mm -hmm. uh, because of and then oh. you use the rental income to pay the monthly payment? Uh, yeah, to, do the monthly payment? to cover all the expenses. And so then in that case, you can make, let's say, 500 investments or so? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You could do that. Or so you could take five, five investments? Yeah, five. You could take, for example, that million bucks and chop that into, let's say, four investments, you know, quarter million each, uh -huh. and then go buy four properties that are million dollars worth each. And you put those 250K as a down payment, you get a very attractive you know, financing. Financing in the US is just incredible. You could get as, as low as 0%. You could go, there's so many ways to structure that. But then you need to find a partner with a good credit score, right? To, to be able to get this. You uh, could, but it's not a deal breaker uh -huh. because it's more important the size of the down payment because the banks look at that first. And they would say, okay, he's coming in with his own skin in the game. Because if you come in with just 5% down payment, of course, your, your, your credit score, your income, and your down, your, uh, uh, the assets, that you, the cash reserves you have going to matter a lot. But if you come in, let's say, with 25 to 30% down payment, that's a lot less risky for the bank. Mm -hmm. They would be more willing to work with you to get that deal structured, finance, give you a lot you know, lower rate because they would know that you're a financially responsible person and you are capable of actually building out that initial starting capital and you're treating this property as one of your kind of 
probably primary residences mm -hmm. and not just an investment property where you're going to put in like 5%. Mm -hmm. Let's sort of backtrack. Let's say I'm, I'm on the, at the first stage trying to pick the geography. Um, I'm definitely a dil dilettante in the space, but let's say if I'm, if I were to think from first principles, I would probably look at all the cities, would look at the, the let's say, the population dynamics of the past 10 years, the cities which are uh, where the population is growing, unlike Detroit, more like up-and-coming cities like Miami or Denver or mm -hmm. uh, cities like that, would look at cities where there's a lot of, there's a limited supply, but a lot of demand. More more people are coming to the cities, but the number of houses is sort of limited. Maybe any other criteria you recommend to look at when you're picking the geography? Yeah, well, you nailed it. Obviously, you did your research from a standpoint of how you would choose a geographic location because the Im immigration from state to state, that matters a lot. Um, because, like, for example, the reason South Florida is such a, uh, not only because I live there, but also because of the numbers of immigration, They're just not only from the U.S., but also from Canada. A lot of snowbirds, snowbirds that are coming into, <laughs> you know, during the winter times. Uh -huh. And then it's, th those numbers play big into just the valuations and appreciation rates of the properties that you look into, the area that you look into invest. Also, for example, state income tax, that matters a lot. Uh, for example, Florida is a no state income tax, one of the very few. Uh, so you have to pay attention to that. Then a lot of the kind of the economic trends as well as what type of companies are moving maybe into that area. What, what maybe they're opening headquarters in that mm -hmm. particular region. What kind of, how many projected jobs they're going to create. Then also you got to look at certain parameters such as the travel dynamics of, you know, how many actual tourists are you getting? Every, all of that is public data, mm -hmm. publicly reported. And you can take a look at year, year, year over year. Is there a growth trend or is it flat or is it go down, downward? Because if you're looking to invest, probably you're going to be either renting that property out on the long term view, in lease options or do Airbnb or something like this. Uh, but also you, 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 you should look at some of the data from a standpoint of the inventory that's on the market right now, the supply and demand that you've mentioned, and also the days on the market, that matters a lot. The property is just sitting there, not selling. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, a, that's an indicator of you know, how, how hot the market is. But on the other side of the spectrum, really good investors are also looking at that data as well. And they're investing very actively in those areas. So market is extremely competitive. So you got to look at how are you capable of competing at the end of the day? Because if the property comes on the market, there's 10, ten offers on it. Mm -hmm. How are you going to stand out? So you also have to develop kind of your own that similar to VC, your investment thesis. How are you going to win those deals? Because like two years ago, same thing in VC. Rounds were extremely competitive. We couldn't get into anything. You have to get very creative and just figure out a way to, to squeeze your check into that round. So very similar from a real estate standpoint. Mm. When it comes to, let's say we have foreign nationals listening to this podcast, mm -hmm. they, they don't have any relatives in the US, they have no credit score. So they, when they, let's say, put in 250K, it will be very hard for them to, to, um, to, get, the, um, to get the mortgage. Um, any recommendations you give you were you were you were to give them? Well, actually, if they want to put in one 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 M in re U.S. real estate yeah. as opposed to REITs, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's a misconception actually ah. that foreign investors don't have a lot of options from the financing standpoint. There's actually a lot of programs, ton of programs. Yes. Actually, a lot to a point that now in Florida, the governor governor is actually talking about prohibiting the international investors from Russia, Brazil, and China uh -huh. not to be able to invest into properties in Florida, uh -huh. mainly because of a lot, the availability of financing options and how, I wouldn't say easy, but you have, you have options. You have options. You're not nice. limited just to one swim lane, whereas a foreign national, just because I don't have citizenship or I don't have a green card, I'm not able to do that. In fact, it's so widely spread. There's so many options that I actually recently friend of mine, she's a mortgage broker down in South Florida. Uh, she's from Kazakhstan. And she said banks actually developed a program that allows you to go do the closing, signing of the documents in the local U.S. embassy here in, in Kazakhstan. I believe. That's how flexible that is uh, from a standpoint just to be able to invest your own money in foreign markets, in real estate, um, kind of abroad. It's just 
the the hard part is in is in the research. The hard part is in the hunt, because the, then you you could really screw yourself over if you don't understand mm -hmm. the semantics of the locality uh, of why that region actually makes a lot of sense from an investment standpoint. And then, do you recommend to partner with someone who has this expertise? I would. How if, do you? Uh, I would. I would hit up my network like crazy. There's there's always going to be somebody in that network. There's also a lot of syndicates that you know I personally participate in, where friends of mine they specialize in certain areas. For example, in Austin, Texas, a friend of mine, she's you know we went to school together. And right now they build out the syndicate that says we're going to go and invest and build multifamily property in Austin, Texas for those reasons. Come in, join. It, it, it's just like a, a VC. I'm now an LP in that fund. But you're able to come in in those syndicates with checks as little as like 5K. Why would you, you would want to do that? You're not going to get much upside with your 5K, your, whatever. But the, the knowledge you're going to obtain through that process how they find properties, how they build, what type of legal documents, all of that stuff can can buy that anyway, can learn that anyway. There's no, I mean, there may be some YouTube videos about that, mm -hmm. but if you are an LP in the syndicate like that, that that just puts you in the front row seat at the at the at that show. Very cool. When it comes to fixing and flipping, let's say uh, the investor wants to go that route. What are your recommendations when it comes to? finding a house to 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 fix the finding the house <laughs> with the projections and you know the um a, you know the after repair value is as we call that those are relatively straightforward to calculate because you can look at the historical data of what the ha similar houses have sold for what are they currently selling for and what's pending so mm -hmm. very easy to track that the more challenging part is finding boots on the ground Number one, finding the very reliable project manager who's going to be your eyes and ears. He's going to show up with the phone and do the FaceTime with you and show you every little corner of the, you know, that renovation. Very challenging to do that. You could, you could, it, it could make or break your entire investment. And then the, the actual crew that's doing all of that renovation, especially in South Florida market, it's such a challenge to find very reliable, good, good mm -hmm. contractors. So if you're doing the fix and flip and all that, I think just especially if you're doing that from you know long distance flipping as they call it, mm -hmm. there's a ton of books in there. The the deeper deep deep deeper deeper pockets, yeah, podcasts. They you know they specialize in that. They talk a lot about the long distance investing, long distance flipping, and all that. Mm -hmm. But boots on the ground and the the actual contractors. That's that's the key ingredient. Mm -hmm. That's a kind of business opportunity for someone to be to be the company, to be this agency, to be oh hell yeah, put some of ground for oh, the investors. You, you'd make buck. <laughs> Get into that, not in VC. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to uh, buying a house and renting it, let's say long-term rent versus short-term rent uh, rentals with like Airbnb or VRBO, any of those uh, websites. Mm -hmm. What are your? How do you think about those two and? How would you contrast those two options? Yeah, it's a it's a balance. I, I try to have both in the portfolio because it's, uh, for example, with with uh, with the longer term rentals such as annual leases, there's very little maintenance. You don't hear from your tenants. You know sometimes, uh, but the the profits that you make are a lot less mm -hmm. because you can't charge the amounts that you can charge on, for example, nightly rates. So you got to balance that. What's important for you? Do you want to have that full-time job managing the Airbnb guests that are checking in, checking out every day? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Or do you want a peace of mind and somebody who's not going to call you? So there's that. But This reminds me of a quick story. I mean, back in 2012, uh, we just finished the university and then... Um, Where'd you we, go to school? Uh, so I, I went to Princeton for master's. So nice. I'm 2012 graduated and... Uh, uh, joined two of my friends who just went through Y Combinator in, in the summer of 2012. And so I joined them uh, as, uh, as their third team member. And uh, we, we, got a, we got a house in, in, in Mountain View, mm -hmm. 6200 uh, a month, a really nice house, good uh, sort of two floors. We were sort of living the Silicon Valley dream, sleeping on the first, second floor, uh, working on the first one. And the only <laughs> revenue we had from the startup we were running is 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 the, we were renting the garage on Airbnb. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I still remember the title uh, we had um, on on the, on our, our Airbnb listing. Uh -huh. It was 
uh, I don't know, like a, a bedroom in an elegant hacker house. <laughs> and That's catchy. We, yeah, we would serve them, uh, I don't know, a cereal in the morning. We would have a nice conversation with them. And some of those people who who stayed like for free, some of them stayed for three nights, four nights. They would like some, it was one, 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 one guy, I can't remember his name, but we would we, in the evening we were just chatting and he was tell he was asking what we do and mm-hmm. when we started discussing programming and then we we were um we were using a tornado uh, sort of framework python framework and mm-hmm. uh there was this um um we were we started talking about it's a very tech sort of uh, to avoid the technical technicalities but we were talking about the synchronous event uh, asynchronous events in in, in python and mm-hmm. the library we were using is called g events mm-hmm. and he happened to be over all that library are you serious <laughs> he was living in our wow. house wow. anyway so that's sort of that's uh, a great story uh, anyway coming awesome. back to the sort of airbnb versus yeah. sure uh, sort of a long-term lease yeah obviously you make a lot more money on short-term rentals mm-hmm. and what does the there's a there's a terminology that describes what you guys were doing is called house hacking ah. because that's that's what you do if you live in a property and you have an empty room or a mm-hmm. garage you can rent it out a lot of people that's starting out in that space they actually start out house hacking mm. because it covers all of your expenses probably you know most of that and you're able to essentially live for free if mm-hmm. that does that but short-term rentals like the airb airbnbs and vrbos a lot more profitable but also a lot more maintenance it's you you gotta have a property manager proper probably involved Mm -hmm. because if you don't then you're gonna go nuts answering all the calls inquiries and just managing all it's a full-time job of its own but could be very profitable very profitable i know people that making really really good money just managing managing just ton of properties Mm -hmm. it could also be a great opportunity just to build that as a business and sell that as a business i've seen some very very interesting uh successful exits where they purchased a portfolio of properties completely flipped them put them on the airbnb designed them properly built a track record revenue streams and sold that as a business valuation was actually as a business of its own which was a pretty interesting in the approach into that when it comes to the personality of um, people investing in real estate mm-hmm. what kind of personalities uh, does this um, business um, kind of conducive for do you like do you happen do you happen to have some some uh, yeah. advice on that front yeah well it's a lot more stable a lot more predictable than VC <laughs> VC where you know 99 percent we're psychologists and therapists that's that's our job our number one job is almost just be a mirror for you mm-hmm. so that we can tell you when you know you 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 either eating shit or you need to just you know step up or whatever but from a real estate standpoint it's a lot more predictable because data is there it's numbers plus buildings don't have emotions you don't have to deal with kind of day-to-day drama or whatever the case is so from a personality of an investor standpoint is just someone who who is very predictable who is very stable who 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 likes to know what type of outcome to expect if you do the the right mathematics right when it comes to understanding historical data of, of that particular property to where it's at now and where it's going mm-hmm. so those are just some of the things that uh, i would highlight for the real estate investor i like the combo you picked you sort of venture capital super risky long-term sort of low, long feedback loops uh with real estate uh more more predictable shorter time horizons yeah. more stable it's a really nice combo you have sort of you are you're creating a nice investment mix on what on, on that front and that, that's a great point you're making those are, that's exactly the reason why we did that you know ideally and i would do both of those things together as well mm-hmm. and that's very smart that's exactly the balance because you go extreme on the risky side to vc you could, i don't think you can get any riskier than that and then you could go something on the other side who is extremely stable we know in five years what type of exit we're gonna have from that property. Nice. The variation of that within a family is like when your wife working for a big tech mm. and you're starting a startup. Mm. <laughs> and yeah, then, exactly. And then, she, and then she funds you for a few years. <laughs> yeah, that that could be uh, that could be another layer of, of complexity too. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about sports. I mean, you. Um, your your dad is a famous uh, uh, boxing coach. Coach. He was uh, a coach uh, for Irma Ibrahimov, who, who is an Olympic champion. I believe in Sydney, right? Two thousand. 
in Atlanta in, as well. In Atlanta, so he was a two X Olympic champion. Yeah, he took he got bronze in Atlanta ninety ah, six, and right. he got gold in Sydney. I didn't watch the ninety six one, but I remember Sydney uh, yeah. very well. Here we were, f we we got four medals in boxing. I think uh, Bigzad Sarkhanov and Irmahan yes. two golds, and uh, Mokhtarhan Lebekov and blanking on the second guy. Wow. We got two silvers, two golds. Wow. I, 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 I remember the history. Sydney, <laughs> Sydney, Sydney Olympics, for some reason, it, it like was so memorable for me. Really? I was, <laughs> I was following it very closely. September uh -huh. 2000. I don't know I, what what yeah, I, was, yeah. I was in school and yes, two thousand. I, I guess yeah, I had yeah. a lot of free time and was watching a lot, <laughs> a lot of TV, not studying. <laughs> yeah. So uh, and your mom was uh, gym, uh, coach gymnastics. In gymnastics. Yeah. Uh, tell us more about what it was like to grow up in a family like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's my favorite topic: the sports and all that, because that's just been so prevalent all my life and still is from just very early childhood. I probably was born in a boxing gym, but the, you know, and it's completely different spectrums of the types of parents as well. One is just on the boxing side, which is extremely violent, very, very tough sport. And then the other side is gymnastics could be very, you know, very gracious, very just almost like a form of art as well. Uh, so th those are some of the things that, you know, growing up, especially kind of, in Taras in 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 the late 80s and 90s boxing was also very prevalent it was well it was like that in in the entire country probably still is um, but just being but just being surrounded by just by that atmosphere atmosphere of just really really tough work uh, and it's like tough physical work and when you combine that with just psychology because at the end of the day you know you, anyone could get strong anyone could you know learn how to punch a certain combinations it's same same i i equivalent I, it's equivalent to tennis as well because my kids are into tennis these days and it's all in this it's all in the mind it's all in the psychology of those are the those are the guys that actually win not the ones that are physically fit not the ones that are the more more experienced from that standpoint but if you're able to develop that psychology for many many years i didn't i completely underestimated that that aspect of sports in general what does boxing teach you about life does it does it, any lessons you learned from boxing which you uh, then um applied in your career and professional yeah. life Good, great question and it, it's still does because it's it, there's just so many ups and downs it's just literally you <laughs> you get your ass knocked out and then what do you do you get up or you just it, it's so those are very very equivalent to what we encounter on day-to-day -day basis in life as you, well. You have a plan until you punch in the face kind of thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Like Mike, Mike Tyson. Tyson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he says, which is true because, you know, it's one thing when you're sparring, when you're practicing by yourself, but when you get into the ring and it's an actual, uh, it's an actual boxing match, it's, uh, it's, it could definitely be a awakening moment when, when you get clocked and it's like, okay, now, <laughs> now it's time to uh, sober up and, uh, get your get your stuff together but that's exactly that from the lessons from a standpoint of just the ups and downs and how you pick yourself up and just the conversations you have with yourself even when you get into the ring it's like dude i was scared shitless just shitless because the guy on the other side looks like a fucking animal he's gonna kill me so how do you go through that conversation with yourself and how do you essentially bring back all of the lessons through the practices because in the practice, that's that's what counts. And then how you bring it all together in action and just apply that, that applies even to this day, to just from every every project that I get involved with or even just at home with family and at work, those are just some of the key takeaways. You know, like you remi uh, describing it reminded me of the, 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 the scariest ring introduction I ever heard. This was a recently, this was a... Um, this is uh, Gennady Golovkin fighting with um, blanking on the name of a fighter. Uh, this, was, this was 2016 in London, a uh, British boxer. Um, oh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, 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 so he was undefeated back then. But anyway, so the ring introduction was um, from Karagan to Kazakhstan, la, 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 all, of, all of that, like 33 wins, uh, 20, I don't know, 30, by the, 30 knockouts. And then the, the, that's the 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 most beautiful line ever 
he knocked out every single opponent he faced in the past seven years. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm, I'm just trying to, when I heard that, I was like, I'm you imagine, imagine the other guy. Exactly. <laughs> like, what, what, are you, what is happening in your head? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly, that's a great, that's a great metaphor because it's like, can you imagine? It's like, dude, who is this guy? I just stuck out everybody in front of me. Yeah, yeah. How do you get yourself hyped up in that sense? That's what all of that discipline that I think yeah. that matters. Crazy. What, what are you doing these days when it comes to sports? Uh, well, my no more no more boxing for me. <laughs> yeah. mm. Well, I do this for fitness. Probably mm. still, my dad still trains. Mm -hmm. Still trains to this day. Works with a lot of kids and all that. He lives in the U.S. at the moment, right? Yeah, they've been there since 2005. So uh, he US. moved away from Kazakhstan to train to to train boxers in, so in the U.S. After 2000 Olympics, mm -hmm. uh, U.S. actually came to him and said, "Look." Amateur boxing is not very developed in the U.S. If you mm -hmm. want to come coach, we'll give you all that. And she's like, fuck yeah, I will. Nice. I've been here for, you know, coaching for 30 years. I don't even have a gym. <laughs> We're training outside. I was reading in Mahan's yeah. interview. He said, like, I was I was training in that gym for free or something. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It, it's the, uh, they started in, uh, I don't know how to translate that, internet. Uh -huh. uh, so the, like boarding school or something? Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Boarding school for, for like, not orphan kids but like very underprivileged kids from like extremely poor areas and mm -hmm. they bring them they live together you know extreme conditions um so so right now it's uh my three kids well I, the little one is not there yet but the my my daughter my son they they basketball tennis Tennis is big. Uh, they they play a lot of tennis. They love that. But I coach all of my all of my kids' teams, the especially basketball, soccer, and American football. So you I, teach uh, in high school, or no, middle no. School? I I coach their Could teams coach ah. because there's so many leagues. So my my oldest is ten. So all of that kind of from from ten to twelve year old category. I have a team. I coach and all that, and it's just for me. It's a fun weekend hobby, huh? Oh my God, it, it, it's just working with kids and just design, just overall, just seeing how like each personality is different and how you design that. And just overall, then observing my son in the whole in, in environment for me is just, man, I like, if if I ever don't ever have to work ever in my life, that would be what I would do. Nice. Just coach kids. It's just so, it just brings you so much, uh, so much fulfillment, so much joy, because if you see, especially somebody coming from completely just little tiny little kid who's super shy doesn't want to do then just blossom and grow from that that's it very rewarding becomes a beast on the court yeah yeah, yeah exactly but it, it's it's a lot of patience a lot of discipline as well because uh but growing up i played a lot of basketball a lot of basketball that was that was my sport i wasn't a fan of box, boxing mm. um, so your dad was coaching boxes but you were sort of uh, uh i guess he would invite you to boxing gym as well but yeah it would be well it wasn't an invitation ah, <laughs> let's put it that way I see. <laughs> it was it was not an option not to go okay. so but the uh, he kind of balanced that saying okay you can also go do the stuff that you like uh, because boxing is just something you know you'll discipline you and all that stuff but basketball was my avenue basketball was my thing I thought I actually was really, really good at it until I came to the States. Ah. Then I realized how trash of a basketball, just overall program the rest of the world is compared to US. It's just, you just can't compete, mm -hmm. can't compete. What are some of your dad's impressions about American amateur boxers and, and when, you, when he would contrast them with, with Kazakhstani amateur boxers? Very impatient, he keeps saying that in a sense. Impatient in the US? Yeah. Ah and no emphasis on the fundamentals the very basics mm. where we would go in and just do one little move mm. just the footwork step forward step back step forward step back you would do that for hours you would stand there in front of a free, freaking mirror and do that just that step alone mm. and that's the soviet school yes. that's how they 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 ingrain so that it's a muscle memory Mm -hmm. When you're getting destroyed in a ring, you don't lose sight of those basics because that's how you also win. Mm -hmm. Because if you stick to the basics, you stick to what you've learned through just the overall mechanics. It reminds me of the Bivol Canelo fight. Where like if you can see that Bivol is sort of mm. Soviet boxing school, a lot of jabs, a lot of very jabs. much so, yeah. very much so. And the American way is more just oriented towards maybe showmanship mm. or just kind of just making that as, as almost like a play uh -huh. which is very entertaining to watch extremely entertaining 
but it, there's not a lot of emphasis on just the basics and just the discipline that comes with that. Mm -hmm. So he, he he talks a lot about that. And when he was first starting out a coach, I remember, because he didn't speak English at the time, I would come in and help translate. Mm -hmm. A lot of coaches would come and they would ask, hey, like, what is that? What the hell? Like, what are you guys doing? Uh -huh. And they would come and take lessons and they would sit and watch like how the whole like Soviet Kazakh school of boxing was was uh, was being performed. That's amazing. And he trains he trains kids in in Miami or Yeah, in yeah, yeah. still still there with all the the kids of different ages and I think for just it's been his life and he does that for fun. Do his students from Kazakhstan still visit him or is he, is he still in touch? Well, probably, you know, in touch, but a lot of them uh, have grown mm. to just not be in boxing anymore. Uh, so there's there's that. And just I'm actually going back to Taras next week mm -hmm. and I, I'm, I'm going to visit a lot of those guys that used to train with my dad. I think Klitschko brothers used to live in Tar Taras, right? Did, did they? I kind of I, re I remember there seeing, was something about yeah. that. I don't know if they lived or they trained or there something was something like about because it because yeah. it was a, uh, a TV show where they visited an apartment they lived in. And someone uh -huh. lives there at the moment, so mm -hmm. they actually knocked the door and said, "Hey, I actually slept here. Yeah, I yeah. went to school there." That's hilarious. That. <laughs> yeah, I actually plan on doing that as well. Visit my old apartments. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fun <laughs> to do. Do you know who lives there at the moment? No just idea. Like, I just haven't been since '99. Ah, uh, left in '99 and never, never went back to. You've never been to Taras since 1999. Always on Matu Astana. Just uh, did you did you uh, um, capture the times when there was no electricity? Sort of yeah, yeah. The, uh, those times. That was the time when when we were yeah, there. Yeah, I read. The '90s and all that. It was fun times. Mm. When it comes to you, you came to the US in 1999. Tell us um, what it has been like. Like you, you, you arrive in the U.S. Um, what are some of your first impressions? What did you do in college apart from studying? <laughs> yeah, the the early days and uh, especially in those the late '90s, 2000s. I mean, because <clears throat> you come from such a different environment where the Soviet Union just collapsed and all that is just free for all here. It's just mm -hmm. crazy jungle. <clears throat> but the over there was completely different, especially in Montana. It's completely different from big cities like Seattle, Chicago, and all of that. Montana, Montana is all like it's you know. Just imagine if I was to compare to that something here, but it's like a almost like a ski resort in the mountains mm -hmm. where everyone is just is just small town vibe and everyone knows each other and everyone is extremely friendly everyone is like you're walking on the street they stop by and say hello how you doing and you're like what like what the, like what do you want to do like, that's a great just, answer just, just <laughs> rob me or <laughs> so it's like putting a putting a jungle jungle cat and getting domesticated uh -huh. uh, but it, it was a lot of fun because i was young at the time just 16 years old and uh coming and just living the college life because everyone there's a lot of uh you know bad press about this college how much value that is and all that but still at the end of the day i think the experience you get just living on campus and doing all of this stuff on your own that uh i mean that's worth it of its own so early days were extremely just interesting engaging just absorbing as much as possible and just trying to get ingrained into just american culture it took a while because i couldn't even like understand the local humor i'm like what the hell? like what the fuck is that so 99 mm. that's a that's a very different time when the 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 prospect of studying in the us from kazakhstan was extremely rare i mean it 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 became more prevalent more prevalent let's say i would say from 2005 onwards yeah. because of Bolashak. but yeah. back in 99 where did this idea even come from mm -hmm. like did you did you have any uh, relatives or what what, what, what yeah. was that like exactly that i mean i had the you know almost of an easy path because mm -hmm. my older sister she had that american dream since she was mm -hmm. like probably 10 years old and she won one of the very first uh exchange programs that was introduced i think in 94 or something like flex that. or no or it was something different mm -hmm. that didn't survive it was like a high school exchange program mm -hmm. so she won that she was one of the very first and then she went to the she got sent to live with the host family in montana and then she stayed entered the university and kind of just graduated when she graduated <clears throat> she kind of just paved the way for me to say here's how you do things here's how you get accepted here's what you need to and here's how you're gonna now pay for college. How do you pay for college <laughs> as a as a 16 year old? Like you have six full time jobs Ooh. on campus. Like what? <laughs> That's the only way. Washing dishes to working in the gym to being a night custodian so you could live for free. 
uh, everything. You you just gotta hustle like crazy, and you 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 can't go home for for those four years, mainly because you gotta work the entire summer and all the winter breaks. So, you but it's possible. Interesting. So, did you work as a librarian in a library or? or? Well, library they didn't pay much. Ah, so you gotta choose your uh, your gigs, right? Especially if you work in the cafeteria, pay was okay, but you also get a lot of free food. So there was a lot of that. Um, in in uh, worked in the gym as well because there's you know you also allowed to study when you work in the gym. For example, you you at a desk, so that gives you an opportunity to catch up on that. The night cust- the night weekend custodian is just when you clean the bathrooms mm-hmm. on weekends. The that's provides you with free free room and board mm. living in the dorms. It's a tough job, but it's free free room and board that yeah, takes yeah. care of a lot of expense. So I, you know, I've I've known quite a few few students who didn't have any scholarship, who didn't take on any debt. Well, we, at that time we couldn't even take student loans. There wasn't any any available to international students. So, but when you hustle and you go through just building out almost like a little portfolio of full time jobs, that's crazy. Uh, yeah. Bolshar students to contrast. Uh, like who came to the U.S. in 05, 06, they had a much easier life. But as a result, they missed out on those opportunities, I would say, to to really to develop your discipline, to hustle, to use a more comfortable life. You just you get your stipend, mm-hmm. your, your your tuition is paid. You just all you have to do is just go do, do, do your homework and prep for tests. But having like so many full time jobs, that's that's incredible. Do yeah. you think that's when you developed your character and or? How did it shape you? For sure. Yeah, for sure. Because at 16, I mean, you're more or less, you think you know who you are, kind of with the, at least the, the the foundation, but you are, you're not yet formed as an individual. And just through that experience, those were very formative years as just that discipline. And I think a lot of the discipline from the childhood really helped during during that process because few people actually cracked them. They said, look, you can't do that going back. Um, but definitely it was a great experience. And I, a lot of my friends were, who were studying with me were from Bolashak as well. And there was just advantages and disadvantages. They missed out on that part, but they also got a chance to experience, for example, maybe working on some really cool projects or just traveling, things like that. So there's, you know, give, you know, give and take to both sides. To graduate college in 2003, yeah. what's the first thing you do afterwards? I, so prior to that, um, my my sister was in, working for IBM in New York, and she was relocating to South Florida. And my my uh, I think my junior year, I came to visit her. And on my flight, um, I think I told the story a few times where the gentleman who was sitting next to me, all the way by the bathroom, turns out to be the CEO of one of the largest mortgage lenders at the time. My name name is Dusty Lashbrook. He we just through that conversation. You were just neighbors. He, he, I was in the middle seat. He was in the window. Uh, and we just started talking. I, I can't even remember what we talked about. I, I, I asked him a few times. I was like, do you remember those conversations? He's like, no. Um, but I guess something clicked. And at the end of the flight, he's like, here's my business card. Incredible. If you need any help, let me know. So I'm like, oh, cool. So And my sister's like, well, I'm relocating. She And I was like, oh, I just met the guy. He's in South Florida. <laughs> we should call him. So yes. I picked up a phone. I called him. And I, I didn't even think he would answer or whatever. But believe it or not, when she came to South Florida, he he said, no questions. I just have her come to my office. I'll greet her. And he, he just did everything. And when I graduated in 2003, I dropped him a note and said, I'm graduating, thinking about coming to Florida. And he stopped me right there. He's like, say no more. Buying your ticket, flying you out, creating a management training program. You're going to rotate through different departments. And then whatever you love. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll so put your you sister working at his company mm-hmm. and yes yes you, you you as well yeah, yeah yeah both of us worked at the at the company and it was it was it was pretty cool great experience that, that's incredible like mm-hmm. I, when I when I was uh, I think college students and uh, a little bit younger I used to have a lot of conversations with my neighbors in the plane but lately I just take a I don't know the aisle seat and just put my earphones and and zone out what 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 has it been like for you like are you still do you kind of miss those times when you were sort of like more uh, laid back and would strike a conversation with your neighbor or? Oh. I think so because, I th- and and I, if you think about that, just no fear of rejection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, right Nothing now. To protect. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. And I think that's, I, 
I, I work on that, but at the same time, us as human beings, as we evolve, we just become more, I think, mm. uh, kind of lenient to, towards the other side. But I, I, I definitely miss that. I think it was just being able to come up and just no fear of judgment, no fear of nothing, no fear of rejection, just striking up the conversation. I think yeah. that's maybe that, that that's the part that probably stood out to him that mm -hmm. some random dude, you know, speaks with this heavy accent, whatever, just start talking to me. And we uh, that's exactly that. Hmm. No, that, that's that's incredible. I, I kind of miss those times as well. Like it's there is sort of the sense of some yeah, the sense of liberty and lack of I don't mm -hmm. know. It's so liberating to just to just do it. Yeah, yeah, big time, big time. And sometimes I talk to my friends from from those days, and we're like, man, at the time we were like we had zero worries, zero worries. But if you think about it, it's supposed to be a very stressful time because. You don't know if you're gonna be able to pay tuition <laughs> next semester. And like, what yeah. the hell are you gonna do? But it, it kind of going back to what you're talking about, that no fear of judgment, no fear of rejection, and just liberty of thought. I think that's actually helped a lot. Nice. What uh, What was your career like afterwards? Did you, uh, so you stayed in in Florida. Yeah, yeah. Wor worked in corporate sector for for quite 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 a few years, and mostly in IT. It was all technology based roles product roles, uh, project management, uh, and then grew through the ranks, uh, led the IT divisions, you know, large corporations as well, uh, fintech, health tech, uh, banking sector as well. Um, and so, yeah, worked in the corporate sector and then also in parallel, always had my own startups, always had my own companies and things like that. Mm -hmm. And then eventually started progressing more towards just a full-time entrepreneurial journey where we built startups and just kind of move from the corporate sector into into something of your own what did you learn about yourself in the in this corporate period of your life and that's a great transition into kind of the skills acquired because the mm -hmm. it's great to you know build your company and all that but if you don't have the foundation of just how to lead at the end of the day um, and how to build teams around you, how to motivate them, how to retain them, how to even find them, how to how to recruit them. I learned a lot through those years, which I think were were incredible, incredible skills when you go in to build something of your own, because that's that's a huge challenge. That's the number one job as the CEO is to hire the right people. And if you're not good at that, you you're going to end up spending most of your time fixing the problems fixing the mistakes of bad hires mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. any any mm -hmm. favorite job interviews job interview questions you developed in that period what do you typically ask well one one question that i, I love asking is in the shape of if if i was to call your manager what what do you think they would say that you could improve upon uh -huh. um and it's it, it's more of a question you what are your pay, weaknesses you, kind of question right it's also paying. It's also you paying attention to exactly what I'm asking. Uh -huh. Usually, people jump in straight. Or if you were to call my my manager, he would say, "I'm good at this, this, and that." But the question is actually asking about what you would improve. Yeah, what you would improve on, uh, and just more from your self awareness perspective. I'm not even looking for praise. I'm not even looking for mm -hmm. some of the things that you're really good at. But are you self aware? So questions like that really reveal some of that character. The other question was very well. There's a series of questions, but when you structure the interview, not as an interview, but more of a conversation, just like you and I are having, I mm -hmm. think that reveals a lot about the personality of the particular person. And are they able to be the, that, you know, comfortable sharing that with you? I think that also says a lot, says a lot about them. Um, funny story, I've, I've interviewed one of our portfolio companies, Quaka co-founders, uh, Maksak Kaderov, he, mm -hmm. during his time at LinkedIn, mm -hmm. we spoke and I asked him a question. I was like, so during the interview process at LinkedIn, what, what were some of the questions they asked you? So he tells me all the blah, 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 the technical questions and all that. And then he goes, the very last question the guy asked me in one of the final rounds, he asked, what, what, are, you, what are you really good at doing with your eyes closed? <laughs> and it's like okay that, that's that's a very interesting question and he answered something whatever but then he asked the guy like why do you ask that question and it made a lot of sense because he focuses on a lot just majority of people jump straight to just some type of uh 
ego driven response like i'm really good at like i can code with my with my eyes closed to just with my hands or whatever not i don't even need a monitor uh -huh. uh, or whatever i can juggle and things like that but those that are a little bit more humble more a little you know more self-aware focus more on things that i'm not so self uh kind of putting yourself on the pedestal i guess mm -hmm. so those are just some of the thoughts around just uh just interviews and when you're going for an interview with a candidate do you have a checklist in your head like thinking like in terms of not 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 the checklist of questions but the checklist of traits you're looking for yeah yeah and that's the hearing responses mm -hmm. um and what to look for in those responses i think is to me that's more important than the actual response in itself and it's things that really help reveal the the character of a person where even if they don't know the answer how do they go about that for example if you don't know a specific answer to a, let's say a technical question do you then admit you don't know that and you go the route of well here's what i would do in a professional setting if i encounter a situation where i don't know something to me that speaks such a huge volume versus you trying to figure out and guess the answer where you would demonstrate your ability to be resourceful creative and not just stopping and waiting for somebody to tell you what to do so those are just some of the examples kind of how to pick out certain traits especially for for certain roles that you know you're missing that particular skill set on your team Mm -hmm. so that that's that and also the questions around just the early days of who who they were as a, as a person uh especially you know for example college days like did you did you join a club or did you go and create a club mm -hmm. that you you maybe you didn't get access to and you said you oh, know fuck you guys i'm gonna go build my own club you know same analogy of like are you are you a cartographer or are you a navigator uh -huh. like are you just navigating the existing map or are you created your own map that's you know that others to follow so those are just some of the small examples that come out through the conversation where like well tell me about your college days what was it like what were you all about were you just a shy little kid in the dorm room doing things of your own you're just out partying things like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there's this great book it reminds me um called work rules by last book the former head of hr at google and he was quoting the research where he says that um, according to this research uh, uh 29 percent um basically the, the whether this candidate succeeds at is at your job uh there are different criteria there mm -hmm. di there's different tests which have uh, uh, a highest correlation with with whether the candidate is actually a great fit mm -hmm. and the highest correlation is a so-called work sample test mm -hmm. so basically like if you are um hiring a floor sweeper the, the best question would be hey here's a broom swipe a, a sort of a floor that's it that's 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 going to be your job that's how i'm going to assess whether you're actually good at this job mm -hmm. sort of a more straightforward approach and one percent i think was handwriting so it's actually it like has no correlation <laughs> with whether you're going to be a good fit and so forth so uh, um, when it comes to energy versus skills mm. where, where do you stand there like do you would you hire high energy really hungry candidates with no skills uh as opposed to a a, a more relaxed sort of work-life balance seeking uh, uh highly skilled professional it, it, I would I would focus more on what their passion is at the end of the day mm. and what is it that they where is it that they trying to go with that because you know I'm also going to be very honest with you during the interview process saying okay here's the job here's the responsibility here's the help we need but I also know that you're not going to be motivated doing that same thing over and over for many many years instead share with me where you want to go and I'll be able to tell you based on that interest, based on that passion, can I then pave the kind of create mm -hmm. a path for you to get that while also working in our organization, while also helping us in the interim with the help that we need. And if we're able to find that path, if we're able to kind of create that mental roadmap for that person to get there, I think that's a great match because also, but if you if you're if not able to clearly articulate what are you really interested in or what are the types of skills you want to develop or maybe you want to be the ceo of your own company you know those are the things that you know i i pay very close attention to through through the interview process and so that that balances whether you're you're just a 
someone who wants just a stable job, do nothing, and that's it, that's also fine. Maybe there is a job for you that to do that in our organization. Or you're just so ambitious that you're going to get bored out of your mind after two months, and then you're going to go start looking for another job, or you're going to hit me up for a raise or a promotion, mm -hmm. something like that. I want to make sure that we're on the same page from the beginning, and we were able to find that common thread that we both can start pulling on. Very cool. At some point, when you decide to do an MBA, so you spent. So, what was the decision making process like? When you decide, like, mm -hmm. what do you do? Sort of, what was your reasoning behind getting an MBA? Yeah, the the first MBA that I got uh, NSU was was a no brainer because at the time my company said, "Well, we'll pay for it if you ah. want to go do your master's." Well, okay, fuck so yeah. You, and do. you could you could like you could do have a full time job while yeah. acquiring an MBA. That's yeah, amazing. And they said we'll pay we'll pay for it. Go, you can choose any any school. So in, you still in get Florida. paid as a full time employee. Plus, you get. You're still in a full-time employee. There's a, you just go nights and weekends. Mm -hmm. The program at the time, hybrid remote degrees weren't quite that developed yet. Mm -hmm. But you just do a night and weekend program, and it was just you know for three years because it was just. So you, you have to like you finish your work Monday through Friday, and then Saturday Sunday you have to do your studies. It's not necessarily every Saturday Sunday. Ah. You do like maybe Friday night part of Saturday, uh -huh. and it's not every week. That's why it took almost like three years to complete. Right. Uh, but it was just a, such a great gig that they would pay for it, and it was. I didn't have any uh, clauses where I had to stay with the company after certain years after the graduation. But it, that also spoke to a great culture that they were cultivating, that, you know, investing into people and that, look, if you want to leave afterwards, that's on you. It's, yeah. we, but we, we're trying to do good things here. Uh, so that, that, that was pretty eye-opening. What, uh, um, what did you learn from that, from the, from the MBA? What, do you, sort of what, what skills did you acquire? What did you learn about yourself? Yeah. <laughs> well, to be honest, I, I came to a realization that advanced degrees, especially in business or something like this, is, is pretty much useless. Uh -huh. uh, you, they, don't, they don't teach you anything per se, but the importance of networking and the importance of just building those relationships with your professors, with your classmates, with the alumni, uh, to me, that was a great, great skill to acquire. Because to this date, a lot of the great success comes out from those relationships, which then later, when I decided to, to pursue another degree, that was also the full emphasis on that to get access to that type of exclusive club, exclusive network of people that are like minded, like, you know, same driven and all the same principles. So that was really the kind of the, the, the lessons learned from, from the master's program. Gotcha. And when you, when you go to HBS, mm -hmm. um, when did it happen? And again, uh, uh, what were your plans? Why were were you thinking of getting this executive pro going mm -hmm. through this executive program at at HBS? Yeah, same. Well, at this time, nobody came and said, "I'll pay for you." <laughs> so <laughs> it was it was a it was a personal decision. So two factors that played into that: uh, the alumni status of HBS to me that was very important. More from a standpoint of the again the legacy perspective for my children i knew that i'm not gonna go learn anything it was just case case method i can buy these case methods myself we can go and just read them all you want and you just you just talk about them in the class that's fine that was great uh so the access to the network was another huge huge uh catalyst for me to make that decision make the huge investment into myself because i knew i was at that transitional period where i'm gonna leave a really 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 cushy job extremely high paying job into probably an oblivion of nothing. And I needed that buffer. I needed that network. I needed those types of resources who would smooth out that transition for me. Mm -hmm. So that, that was the thought process that I went through. And it was just, you know, it was an investment both on the sides of my, my own family as well, because it's taking the time of completely going on campus. Um, so that, that was the, that was the so you live, live, back, back then, back then, so your, your family lived in, in Florida, but you lived in Cambridge. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you, you, you do travel back, you do four months there, four months virtual. So that was, that mm -hmm. was the structure. What are some of the most memorable classes you took? Some, uh, uh, maybe some of the most memorable case studies, um, which you still remember? Yeah. One really stands out. It's called, uh, Is, uh, Islin Chan going to Singapore or something like that. And it was a case study on one of the former students herself who ro rose essentially through the ranks of just being the complete lowest level associate to the CEO of the largest REITs in Southeast Asia. Mm. Um, 
and it was an incredible story because and then i got so inspired by that that i actually found her i reached out to her and i hosted her on on my podcast as Amazing. well and we talked a lot about how you like the title of the episode is actually how to get harvard to write a case study about you <laughs> so that was very memorable and, and and how just she was able to kind of be very patient through just so many years and dedicate herself just to the one single organization and grow go grow through the ranks all the way to the top I, that was very memorable and then she actually came through zoom through skype whatever to the class and just talk spoke to us and how also the case study about her kind of also put her on another stratosphere from a perspective of just the credibility and just the opportunities that really that, that opened up. Mm -hmm. So that was the one of the most uh, memorable uh, case studies. Do you think case study method is effective? Oh, extremely, especially at that level. I don't know if that would be effective at, you know, maybe undergrad level, which they still do that mm -hmm. because, you know, there's so many, you know, reasons for that mm -hmm. because as a professor you're able to observe then how just the the class interacts with itself who is who is in the lead role who is in the supportive role thing and what, how, what types of arguments come up and how do you handle that debate uh but at that advanced level degree level it makes a lot of sense because there's just so much experience in the room mm -hmm. is and everyone comes from f very different spectrums of life that's because they do a really good job designing that class because one of the interview questions before you apply is just, you know, how do you think you would be a contributing factor? How, what, what kind of value are you going to bring to your classmates with the perspectives that you have? So that, that, that really plays huge into kind of the, the case method that, that they, that they foster. Mm -hmm. And, um, around that time you decide to start a podcast, IV podcast. Yeah. Um, you you recorded seven around 700 episodes <laughs> yeah. right what are some of the most uh, memorable episodes you mentioned one of them uh if you, any any if anyone else comes to mind yeah quite a couple of them the the ceo of deloitte oh. um he i got lucky to i got introduced to him and we got a chance to sit down and just uh kind of the lessons that he shared from he just from a humility standpoint just being a very extremely humble person and the role of empathy in his leadership, how he is capable of putting himself in your shoes and just essentially try to correlate with the problems that you deal with, with ambitions and all of that and design an organization from that standpoint. I think that was pretty incredible. Um, the the uh, president of Microsoft uh, US, Debbie Cup, share her some of the lessons she shared and the, actually the role of sports uh how that translates to her kind of that servant leadership style that that she has and just being able to fully focus on empowering your people and the rest just let the magic happen and just don't get in their way and the whole concept of just it's better to ask for forgiveness than for permission there's just a, such a powerful thing that kind of resonates through some of these interviews so those really stood out mm -hmm. are you planning to have a video version at some point we started experimenting with that it's very early we we started recording with video uh but the reason i didn't want to focus so much on the video is because i really wanted to focus only on the audio aspect mm -hmm. because of just how much focus you focus you need to be when listening to the particular episode where it's all you all zero in on the mm -hmm. things that are being said in the video format, it's a little bit different. There's a lot of moving parts. You look at the nonverbals and all of that. So that was that, that was really the reason for it's that. It's also like when it comes to the host and the guests, they don't have to think about how they how they look, and it's easier to to jump in. They can be I don't know. It can be an actor sitting in a trailer. We oh. have a free free hours. Okay, let's do it. Hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, That's yeah. how we were able to crank out seven hundred episodes. Yeah, yeah. Because it was like, like, hey, don't worry about it. You could be you could be naked in bed, whatever. <laughs> just get a, get, get yeah, a phone. Get I a see you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nobody's gonna see you. <laughs> <laughs> just, just talk just tell me what's in your head and we'll share that and that's it no it's 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 it's, it's a good point like the, you want to pick uh, the format which um which is sustainable 
right? Like yeah. a format where, where you can see yourself doing for a long, long period yes. of time because it's a, it's a really a marathon. Yeah. If, if you, you can, anyone can do like 10, 20 episodes, but can you do it just like Joe Rogan? Like can yeah. you do a thousand plus? Well, you know it now. You have, you have a podcast we, we of 100 episodes. And we, you, we haven't reached 100 yet. Yeah. You, yeah. Know, you know how hard that is. So I actually, um, I, did, I had a podcast when I was a student. Uh, mm -hmm. We did, uh, I did uh, back when I was, it was all me, just I did like 25 episodes, I think. Mm -hmm. But then I quit. Yeah. And I didn't do it for 10 years. Mm. So it's sort of after a 10 year hiatus. So this year I'm coming back. So I have this kind of experience of quitting. So that's why my internal metric at the moment is to just, yeah. just don't worry about views. Don't worry about comments. Just, just make sure that you make hundred episodes and then it becomes a habit. Well, I like what you said about just being a, building a sustainable model, mm -hmm. uh, because then you could really focus on on the information that's being shared with you because I, I also was worried a lot about just the video aspect and all of the the semantics that happens behind the scenes but mm -hmm. if you make it repeatable if you make it a simple process i think then you can really focus on just the the actual content yeah and ultimately it's you don't want to make it like look like work because then you give up i mean i mean for for, for myself this is a uh, this is a really a hobby where I explore my curiosities, where mm -hmm. I ask questions I'm generally curious yeah. about. And uh, I don't want it to be more than that. I don't want like to bring people uh, who I, I don't know, who I haven't talked to before. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it should be a pleasure. It should be something oh, you look forward to. 1000%. And yeah. I do this for mm -hmm. very selfish reasons as well, because yeah. it's, I want to host that person and I want to learn what's in his head or her head yeah. and what are just the things that maybe I am completely not aware of. So it's just throughout the process, you learn so much. And for me, I get, I get a lot of my energy by interacting with other people. That's my, one of my main sources of energy. And that, that was just also one of the reasons. Yeah. It's actually interesting how, um, I think a lot of people uh, who uh, watch podcasters, they think that they do it for, some transactional reasons i don't know a personal brand or i don't know like people tell me stuff like that but they don't realize that it's really just pure creative pursuit you mm -hmm. just want to learn something it's it's actually maybe it doesn't sound believable yeah. in, in this in, in this very transactional world mm -hmm. where you have to get something for something yeah. but it's it's is as simple as just hey uh I'm just doing it because I love it. <laughs> That's yeah. it. Well, and I also think why, why, why your podcast works as well is because of just exactly what you said. Uh, and there's, you know, even before the podcast, we just said, you know, hey, just let's keep it casual. There's just some of the areas we want to talk about and just let's just let's just riff yeah. riffing. And I, and I think that's the beauty of that from a standpoint of just building the sustainable model. Mm -hmm. Coming to a close, what future excites you? What are the trends you're seeing? Uh, what occupies your, your mind these days? With all the hype around AI and everything that we see in these days, I, 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 I actually think a little bit from the other side of the spectrum of where that's gonna take us as just, a, you know, just human species in general. Um, and what are the opportunities on the other side of the spectrum that are not, you know, elements of just that human factor that are completely irreplaceable by whether that's tech, whether that's AI, whether that's anything else that's going to come, you know, next month. Uh, so I'm fascinated by by those things that that are you know you you're not able to replicate through some type of automation. And opportunities in that space um, are interesting to me. The just the overall kind of freelance almost that revolution where that shift from just uh, just the corporate sector and not so much going into I'm not talking about the entrepreneurial side but being able to utilize the skills that you you've developed and build that niche around that and monetize that there's kind of that kind of the the component that I see a lot of potential in and just like with every everything else with you know in VC space we we just consume so much content to be able to try to stay a little bit ahead of the curve uh, on all the trends that are happening right now and what we think would happen afterwards so that's you know those are the things that we you know I spend a lot of time researching because I I my job is my side of the table is to not go for the masses in terms of investments but rather go into that one 
one one hit wonder so to say just go into the one company that that's going to be that fund returner that's going to be that that big unicorn mm -hmm. um one of the uh chapters one of the chapters in our podcast is sort of recommendations top three um what are your top let's say three podcasts the podcasts you tend to listen on a regular basis easy easy answer uh Patrick O'Shaughnessy's and that's like the best. I love that because of just the, I learn a lot from him more as an interviewer, as a host, the types of questions he asks and how he's able to derive information out of that. I, I actually listen to a lot of his podcasts for that. Um, so that's a great podcast. Uh, Deeper Pockets, the, it's a group of guys that interview and talk a lot about just investment strategies in real estate and how to build businesses around that. That's another podcast I'm a big fan of. And um, Dr. Peter Atia, uh, he's an expert in like longevity. I'm just reading his book, The Outlive, which is I highly recommend that. Me getting into my 40s, that's been kind of my, my th those are the trends that I study. Those are the trends that I'm passionate about, just that longevity aspect and just overall health, how you optimize yourself now so that when you get to 80, and you design that life, here's some of the things that I want to be able to do with either my kids, my grandkids, and things like that. And what's the path that's going to get me there? So many moving parts. So his podcast is pretty incredible that he talks a lot about these different strategies. And What, what uh, recommendations are you following these days when it comes to longevity, sports? The nutrition is... is uh, Probably the main core of the fitness and all of that is important, but it's not so much of a driven dri the driving factor. The the mental health aspect as well. It's it's an incredible overlooked area that's now getting some visibility, but there's also a lot of strategies there. But also being able to design just your own life right now that you're living, with the view of when you're gonna be, you know, of age 80, 90. What is it that you want to be able to do? And mm -hmm. just going backwards from that, I think that helps shape some of the strategy where you know, giving up alcohol or giving up, you know, sugar, things like that. Giving up fat, right? Oh yeah, there you go, the uh, moonshine. The moonshine. <laughs> I was, uh, so, uh, so Jean gifted me this and I was silly enough to uh, think that I can try it uh, during the episode. But then I saw it's 40% alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a little souvenir from uh, the Thank Smoky you. Mountains from Tennessee. It's just the unique, the, unique yeah, packaging. Yeah, handmade. They the, they make their own moonshine. So it's just uh, I bring little souvenirs from when every every summer that I come from the states. Thank you. When it comes to your favorite books, mm -hmm. what are some of your recommendations? To there's a there's a lot there's a lot of books uh, that that are favored that probably could be classics for you know quite a few people. Uh, I'm not gonna name those. I'm 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 only I'm gonna name a couple that really stood out to me in the past few years. Uh, the one that I just mentioned by Peter Ati Outlive. It's a huge book. It's ginormous. It's, it's a heavy read. There's a lot of terminology, a lot of the things, but he covers a Lifting lot. Lifting that is part of the longevity, I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that's part of the exercise. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's one book that I would recommend. The the um, there's a book. It's called the Mental Mental Toughness Handbook. Uh, I can't remember the name of the author, but I'll, I'll look that up. You can add that in the show notes. But it's uh, it's he he talks a lot about the different mental fitness strategies he doesn't talk about mental health he talks about mental fitness mm -hmm. and the exercises that you can actually execute to be able to to get yourself mentally fit which was just a completely different concept for me mental health versus mental fitness so that was a great book and right now i'm also reading the autobiography of dyson uh highly amazing recommend that amazing entrepreneur is just like how just to be able to stick to one craft for so many years, unbelievable how you're able just without just any interruption, any lose of focus, work on just developing that technology and how only recently it started becoming, you know, success. Uh, to me, that was pretty fascinating. So those are just the three books that I would highlight. Top three people you follow on Twitter, top three blogs. ITS blog, I mean, he that's one of the top ones, mainly because of just there's so many lessons learned from the book that comes out that I try to pick out on the actual, uh, from the from the blog perspective. 
from from the people that are follow, lots of VC content. I, uh, I tend to read quite a few of those guys, but I try to consume only just the headlines uh, and live in my you know understanding. I live in my own little bubble versus kind of what is it that I don't know out there. So those are just some of the you know probably the feeds that I love to get my mind you know exposed to, and also the whole just the concept of just information overload and how are you keep keeping yourself concentrated into a particular area that's uh, maybe not of your day-to-day -day job those are just some of the things that i try to surround myself with what's, what's your favorite music <coughs> um country i i really really love that they developed the love for country music in in during my time in montana a lot of folks don't understand it i it's an acquired taste i understand that but it takes 20 years exactly <laughs> but the 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 music that i listen to i these days not so much the vibe and the rhythm but more of the 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 content what's the story being told what's the, what are they essentially singing about so i pay attention to the actual words of the of the songs the most recent country song i listened was i would say a year ago maybe two years ago mm -hmm. uh this was uh, the song from uh the, the show about the creation of Theranos. um uh, uh dro dropped out uh, dro 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 dropout yeah dropout i think that's the name of the show yeah and uh, yeah. the name of the song is um i just wanted to get it done something like, it's it's a really it's a country it, song it's a country song the favorite oh. song by elizabeth holmes mm. a really nice tune. Really? I, actually, I actually found it on youtube wow liked it, i missed that spotify can i uh, will we'll look up the, the title it's it's a really nice tune and uh that's probably maybe the only country song i actually uh, favorite <laughs> on youtube but anyway <laughs> i'll send you some links i'll send you some links to some really good music that uh you'll uh hopefully uh, take a few years to acquire. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that taste. Uh, your favorite movies, documentaries. Lots of uh, autobiography documentaries that I love to watch. You know, the especially you know the documentaries on the like the Last Dance. The, the I'm reading his autobiography as well, Michael Jordan, and it's amazing to read the story of just extreme early days when he was battling on the court with his older brother, who would just totally annihilate him. And how that really shaped just that competitive the times edge. when he was wearing Converse, Converse shoes. Yeah, not that Nike. too. <laughs> yeah. That too. That too. When the his mother just negotiated the whole deal. Uh, I, you know, in my free time, the way I also I fall asleep. I watch a lot of uh, like apocalypse zombie type shows. Uh. Uh, so that's just frees my mind of completely not thinking about anything. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 that's the type of content i would consume uh when i have time to actually watch something wouldn't you have three kids uh you have a family you have a wife uh, so how do you balance um so many different projects you run you have a uh, you have a venture capital business you have a real estate business how do you balance that how when what do you have a specific days with family do you spend your evenings with your family do you go on dates with your wife every evening what are some of the some of the things you do Great question, and that's uh, I have a very simple and straightforward answer for that. Is the family is actually the reason I got into the current engagements from the venture capital side, from the real estate investment side, mainly because of the flexibility it would allow me to build my my work around my family versus mm -hmm. the other way around, and that allows me with an opportunity just not to schedule anything and not to design that only certain days I spend with my family or only certain days we go on dates or whatever the case is. It's extremely ad hoc. It's, you know, whenever the feeling is right or whenever the need is right, you're able to do that. Mm -hmm. And that was the given trade uh, that I had to go through, whether I have an extremely well-paid, cushy job, but that whole aspect of the flexibility and not having your own boss that was the limitation mm -hmm. and do, do is when when you have this fluidity uh, at the same it's sort of um, easy to uh, um, get into work mode and maybe not spend time with your family how do you make sure that you actually allocate time for your kids and and then the on your wife it, well it's a it's an investment right it's uh -huh. the most important investment that we all have and not forgetting that that to, that probably you know we only have 16 years with our kids very short period of time 
after 16 years, they're gone. They go in college, they go in the, yeah, sure. We're going to see each other on holidays and all that. But the time together, very limited space. Mm-hmm. And when you think about it from that standpoint, actually, so true. Actually, a little bit depressing because then you, it really should light fire under your ass to be able to focus on that mm. because we're all like oh kids are small let me go hustle grind and do all of that stuff when and then they grow and you're like oh shit and then now they you know i actually missed that whole side mm. so that was really the thought process around that and how do you build your career so that you are able to to do that you're able to be so flexible around that space that was just for me the kind of that that catalyst for to be able to design that such a great point when you when you go to college the amount of time you spend with your parents is much, much less than the time you spend with your colleagues, with your friends, and so forth. You just maybe uh, goes down, them, goes down dramatically. Yeah, and uh, such a great mm-hmm. reminder. Uh, thank you so much, John. I mean, uh, what an incredible conversation we had. Uh, so many more chapters to, to, um, to, to, to uncover. But let's uh, have let's keep that for uh, for round two. Well, point. the round two I want to have on my podcast, <laughs> where we're we gonna do the grilling and the interrogation of <laughs> of Arman and everything that's With inside I, in his head, and we'll we'll extract all of the wisdom out of you. We'll, we'll look forward to that. I mean, we can do a, we we can do in person one as well. I hopefully we'll make it to the US in September. Uh, uh, yeah, so looking forward. Uh, and w- the last thing um, at the end of the program, um, guest typically asks a question to, to the audience, mm-hmm. anything you would like to ask? Uh, that's also, uh, I will plagiarize, I'll steal, uh, just like jobs. Just like great artists. Uh, yeah, exactly. I, uh, so from one of my favorite podcasts that I've mentioned, uh, the invest like the best one of the questions that he always asks every guest at the end of the show is, what is, um, what, what is, the, what is the kindest thing someone has ever done for you? I mean, that's such a powerful question. A question. I always keep thinking about the variation of that without just being so obviously blatantly stealing that question. What, but it's it's a great question. And if you think about it, there's just so much so much behind the meaning of that question. And and I just love that. And that's the question that I would ask and, and try to think from a standpoint, what is the kindest thing someone has ever done for you? And maybe what, how that shaped you as a person and what that led you to do the other kind things to others. It's a great reminder that, I mean, there's not such a thing and such a concept as self-made because mm. there's this very popular concept in, in, the, in the media is self-made, she's self-made, but there's, there are no self-made people. No. Everyone stood on the shoulders of giants. Yep. You 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 worked with someone, someone taught you, someone gave an influence, someone influenced you in a, in a way. That. And that question sort of highlights that yeah. uh, in a really big way. So a question for an audience. Um, what's the most beautiful thing someone has ever done for you? Please leave it in the comments below and uh, we'll pick the best. And uh, it will be incredible to to read those stories in the comments. Looking forward to that. Excellent. Thank, thank you so much, John. Likewise, Armand. I appreciate the invitation and your your time. It's the 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 stuff that you do is uh, I think is very meaningful because you personally learn a lot through these conversations. But being able to expose that to others, I think that's you know that's very underappreciated aspect. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. This was Enfectual Podcast. Be so good; they cannot ignore you.